We know the masses, we know the theater. The best among those who sit there, German youths, Horn Siegfrieds, and other Wagnerians, require the sublime, the profound, the overwhelming. That much we are capable of. And the others who also sit there, the culture cretins, the petty snobs, the eternally feminine, those with happy digestions, in some, the people also require the sublime, the profound, the overwhelming. Whoever overpowers us is strong. Whoever elevates us is divine. Whoever leads us to have intimations is profound. As many of you surely realized here, I parody Def Fall Wagner. Nietzsche thought little of musical dramatic aspirations to transcendence. He was not alone, and I want to propose here that operetta was the perfect antidote for what Nietzsche then considered to be Wagner's overheated excesses. Operetta would seem to be all the things Wagner is not. Light, concerned with the present day, conscious of its own fakeness, unable to countenance mysticism. It deals not in mythology, but rather the glorious stupidities of regular folks. Its melodies are not endless, but rather simply structured and very repetitive. The genre is also mercilessly parodic, in the sense of transposing the music of serious high art composers into a frivolous context. That was at least the ideal of operetta as defined by its more demanding observers. But, these same critics quickly said, operetta had lost its edge. It increasingly trafficked in sentimental second-hand Wagnerisms, peddling bargain basement transcendence to the masses. Today I will focus specifically on operetta's engagement with the cult of Wagner. Um, I will first consider Wagner parody in Oskar Strauss's 1904 Die Lustige Nibelungen, then the more earnest Wagnerisms of Zigeunerliebe by Franz Lehár, which dates from 1910. The changing norms and goals of uh, operetta provide a lens into the shifting place of Wagner and quasi-Wagnerian aesthetics in Viennese popular culture. In practice, there was no wall separating Wagner and operetta, but the extravagances of Wagnerian music drama, as well as the passion of its devotees, became cause for ridicule both inside and outside of the German-Austrian context. The most famous of these spoofs is the Tannhäuser of Johann Nestroy, dating from 1857 in which Venus is the proprietress of a wine cellar, and the Rome narrative steps out of the drama to chart the Helden tenor's journey from singing Tamino to vocal ruin. Notoriously, this parody was widely performed in Vienna before the actual thing. When the real Tannhäuser finally premiered at the Hofoper in 1859, Edward Hanslick noted that the German tenor singing the title role was totally be bewildered when the audience began to laugh at the shepherd boy, ignorant this scene was already familiar as a routine by a local comedian who sang a suggestively retext my lead and honked on a bassoon. <laughs> Nestroy was also responsible for Operetta's arrival in Vienna, organizing the first pirated performances of Offenbach in the Karl Theater in the early 1850s. But the rise of pan-Germanic nationalism and anti-French sentiment, particularly in the wake of the Franco-Prussian War, abetted the rise of native Viennese operetta, whose composers had big ambitions. In 1886, Hanslick had already criticized the turn of operetta to opera, writing, quote, our newest operettas, which are really ill-advised grand operas with two or three Girardi couplets cramped into them, mean the ruin of this self-consciously simple, likable genre, end quote. To some, such as the music critic Eric Raban, writing in Du Musique in 1903, Offenbach's world of satire and simple jingles was a sort of paradise lost. Operetta's beginning, apex, and end. Urban proclaimed that his native Berlin would reinvent operetta, courtesy of its cabaret scene. The first cabaret in Berlin was the short-lived but influential Bundestheater, or Überbrettel, founded in 1901 as a satirical, intellectually ambitious sort of variety theater by Nietzsche enthusiast Ernst von Wolzogen, half-brother of Hans von Wolzogen. The Überbrettel's house composer was Oskar Strauss. Strauss was an Austrian Jew born in Vienna in 1870. While conducting at various provincial opera houses, he began to compose light music. After success at the Überbrettel, Strauss began his first operetta to a libretto by one of the cabaret's writers, a lawyer named Fritz Olivin, who went by the pen name of Rideamus. This was to be Die Lustige Nibelungen, an operetta that was like the Überbrettel grounded in satire. It lay unperformed for several years, until while visiting Vienna in 1904, 
Strauss secured a premiere run at the Carl Theater, where it was first performed on November 12th of that year. Die Lustige Nibelungen satirizes contemporary German culture through the model of the Offenbachian mythological operetta. The source material is circa 1200, the Nibelungen lead epic. After its rediscovery in the mid 18th century, it was transformed into a monument of exclusionary nationalism. The first half of the epic is also, of course, the basis of uh, Wagner's Siegfried's Toad, the eventual Götterdämmerung. The operetta's plot is more, uh, drawn more directly from the Nibelungen lead than it is from Wagner, though it is like, likewise restricts itself to the first half of the epic. Ludwig Uhland had proclaimed the Nibelungen lead too fixated on brute physical strength and external events to be suited for classical drama. This had, however, not stopped Friedrich Hebel, whose popular 1861 tragic drama Die Nibelungen is parodied in the operetta's first scene. The lack of a psychological dimension would prove ideal for transposition into operetta. The madcap succession of violent happenings require little alteration to become comedic. Ride Amusi's Tin Pot Wurm's court has the worst qualities of Wilhelminian Germany. An obsession with making money, no interest in education, a fascination with titles, and over-the-top bellicosity. The libretto lampoons the sacred status of the Nibelungenlied, as well as invocations of the so-called Nibelungen Troja, in a number of comic twists that po poke at the absurdity of literally applying the epic to a modern context. Brunhilde arrives by train. Siegfried's presence in Brunhilde's bridal chamber is revealed when she switches on an electric light. Siegfried's talking bird offers stock tips, and the denouement involves the bankruptcy of the Rhine Bank, news delivered by telegram. The music of Die Lustige Nibelungen displays a stylistic plurality common to operetta, though in a rather unique combination. There are three aspects I would like to highlight. It's parodic transpositions, Viennese waltz material, and Offenbachian motto technique. While Wagner's presence in the libretto is unavoidable but unacknowledged, his place in the music is precise and specific. The first of these parodies involve Krimhild, which is Wagner's Gutrune, telling of her vision of the approaching Siegfried, a scene that is not include by, included by Wagner. Strauss and Rideamus imitated Wagner anyway, suggesting that their parody is less a matter of specific Wagner work than the general culture of Wagnerism. Their choice is Einsam and Trubentagen, fun, uh, from Act I, Scene Two of Lohengrin, whose content is obviously similar. A short excerpt is found on the handout as example one. This is just the notation, and I will play the example now. Tempo, range, melodic contour, instrumentation, and some of her words echo Elsa's. The voice begins on the same note, an E-flat, and slowly descends to a woodwind accompaniment. The uh, texture is devoid of a firm bass register. In Strauss's version, the violins and violas play a high celestial chord, one that is absent from the start of Elsa's speech. Rather, we are given the signature sound of Lohengrin as a whole as found in the beginning of the Act One prelude and the openings of Infernum Land and Mein Lieber Schwan, for example. After Elsa finishes her invocation, the male chorus responds in amazement, asking if she is in a trance. Strauss, in mar marked contrast, immediately breaks the spell, with Kriemhild's mother exalting her daughter's speech, oh, our child is so poetic, she comments, singing in a swinging waltz that was described in one review as Gassenhauerlich, like a, a street song. The jarring proclamation of the poetry and beauty of Krimhild's speech neutralizes any genuine enchantment that may have been retained from Wagner. This example is found as number two in the handout, and I will play it now. Oh, 
Other parodic material includes Siegfried's horn call, the duet in which Krimhild attempts to get Siegfried to disclose his vulnerable spot, which is drawn from Act Three of Lohengrin, a ballad whose arpeggios and strumming harp imitate Minnesang, a contrapuntal anthem that has five or six too many entries, and an episode of Mach Stabrheim Declarations of Love, which include Mechstige Mitgift, Mighty Dowry. While the Wagnerian is torn from its context, the waltz is an expected component of any Viennese operetta. Oscar Strauss and Rudi Amus recode the waltz from Johann Strauss's joyous romance to express instead the character's self-satisfaction, complacency, and idiocy, as expressed by Krimhild's mother. Another waltz is found in the refrain of Siegfried's song describing the Nibelung Hort. As Siegfried sings of the Rhinegold, later joined by the chorus, the horn and wide arpeggios in the strings evoke the Rhine music of the ring. The third technique can be heard at the end of this same example. It is music in Offenbachian motto technique, which is a term I borrow from Carl Dahlhaus, um, refer referring to a melodic line constructed of short repetitive uh, motivic cells, most of them in either straight eighth notes or straight sixteenth notes, featuring predominantly scalar motion, generally in duple meter. The waltz and the motto technique can, are found in example three in the handout, and the text is here up, up here on the slide. So obviously there's a pun here between the bank of the river and the savings bank. Just pointing that out in case you didn't notice. This collage of musical styles is typical for operetta of this period. It reveals a genre with claims to many different influences, such as dance music, French theater, and comedy. This multivalent identity was, I argue, a reason why operetta was so contested. Die Lustige Nibelungen's pointed lack of grand operatic music, except for moments sending it up, was in fact an ideological statement about operetta's place and purpose. At the end of this song, the clan mentions that Siegfried has bought a sparkling wine factory. This seeming non sequitur is easily explained by the existence of a sect known as Rheingold, made by the Sinline firm, firm, supposedly endorsed by Wagner personally, and served exclusively at the first Bayreuth ring. As you can see here. Um, in the French hostile years following the Franco Prussian War, Sinline seized the German market with advertisements promoting their German sect as an equally tasty and nationalist alternative to French champagne. Some ads featuring a Valkyrie-like figure, others showing a bottle positioned as a cannon. This recalls that Strauss was using French tricks to make fun of the Germans, which did not go over entirely well. The critic for Der Flo uh, warned that some of the jokes may be too arch for an operetta audience, and Julius Stern commented in the Fremdenblatt that the audience for the Ring Cycle was unlikely to sell out an operetta theater night after night. Perhaps proving the point, the anonymous critic for the Neues Wiener Journal incorrectly identified Krimhild's romance as imitating Sieglinde rather than Elsa. In 1908, the Stadttheater in Graz decided to open their season with Die Lustige Nibelungen. Two days later in the same theater, there was to be a concert by the Akademische Richard Wagner Verein dedicated to handicraft in German art, including music of Wagner, readings of Goethe, and a play by Hans Sachs. Clearly, Strauss's point still stood. Shortly before the operetta's performance was to begin, the Verein Sudmark, a sizable German nationalist association dedicated to the promotion of German language in border regions, issued a call to arms in the evening papers. It read, An die deutsche Bevölkerung der Landeshauptstadt Graz, to the German people of the provincial capital of Graz. In a time when the lives of our countrymen in the north and south are threatened by Slavic hordes, do you know what is happening in the Grazer Stadttheater, which should be a place for German art? They are showing people nothing less than the ridiculing of the most magnificent thing our people possess, our Nibelungenlied, the most towering achievement of all world literature. The members of the Verein dutifully assembled at the performance, and what followed was described by the Grazer Volksblatt as the biggest theatrical scandal in Graz in decades. 
Despite a plea for peace from the intendant before the performance, he said that it was a harmless burlesque that could not be further from a profanation of Germanness. The ensuing circus of yelling, stamping, and heckling of the actors ended in the mayor of Graz rising from his box to implore the protesters for their silence and the police clearing the orchestra-level standing room. The riot was surely motivated by German nationalist concerns, likely with anti-Semitic elements as well. But it also reflects a public that took its operetta very seriously and increasingly considered it not an antidote to high culture, but rather something that should adhere to the same rules. In 1903, Franz Lehard written in Die Vaga, above all, true artists must dedicate themselves to the genre of the operetta and produce musically substantive operettas. Lehar's 1905 smash, Die Lustige Witwe, combined Offenbachian Buffo writing with much more typically operatic imitation folk song. But in nearly each subsequent operetta, the operatic tendencies became more prominent and the Offenbachian ones less. In 1910, Lehar premiered the opera like Zigeunerliebe, set to a fi fantastical romantic story of a girl who, on the eve of her wedding, fantasizes of running away with a quote unquote gypsy. Well, appreciation of Die Lustige Nibelungen requires knowledge of epic, Wagner, and German culture, Zigeuner Liebe manufactures an entire world that is timeless and mythic. The score contains an unusually lengthy description of the set, combining geographical specificity with romantic scenery and exaggerated sensory detail. The couple in this studio produ production postcard do not face the camera and the implied audience, rather they are lost within each other. The operetta opens with a storm scene that has little purpose in the plot, but allows for a scale of orchestral writing foreign to operetta as conventionally defined, with a musical depiction of a storm complete with roiling arpeggios, wind machine, thunder, and lightning, the latter possibly a lighting effect that has been written to the score. This sets the stage for heroine Zorica's entrance, which she makes letting out hayas that recall Brunhilde's Hoya to Hose at the beginning of Act Two of Die Valkyrie. This is found in, as example four in your handout. is a portrait of Zorica's wild and unrealized dreams. While this connection may seem painfully obvious, it implies a dimension utterly foreign to Die Lustige Nibelungen and to Offenbachian operetta by definition. It became, however, standard in 20th century Silver Age works. The psychologization of operetta was condemned by many as a radical departure from the genre's ideals, most notably by Karl Krauss in the essay, uh, essay Grimaces About Culture and the Stage, published in Die Fackel in 1909. To Krauss, Silver Age operetta served to, quote, drown the suspicions of the people in music, end quote. Would-be free-thinking audience members were brainwashed and numbed into passivity as Lehar's lush orchestration swept them away into a non-existent happier world. In Krause's anti-war drama, The Last Days of Mankind, chatter about operetta takes the place of discussion of more serious matters. Offenbach was, for Krauss, an ideal whose irrationality relaxed the mind and stimulated the imagination. The opposite to Offenbach was Lehar, but it was also Wagner, whose devotional exercises are a theatrical absurdity. Parody joins Wagner and operetta in the manner of an electrical circuit. One cannot be un fully understood without the other, as the Viennese Tannhäuser had learned all too late. Parody disrupts and disturbs, but it also reinforces the cultural hegemony of the object being parodied. Wagner's ideology might be mocked, but it and its influence it are at the same time acknowledged and publicized. A coda. Some critics, including Julius Stern and Ludwig Karpath, and composers such as Lehar, saw quasi-Wagnerian in operetta as a way to, quote-unquote, elevate the genre and force the public to a higher level, something that is seen literally here in reference to Lehar's mountain operetta and Lichy Line. Uh, most high art critics foreshadowing Adorno disagreed. 
In their terms, operettas slightly belated salvo at Wagnerism did not make the genre more aesthetically autonomous and thus more artistically significant, but rather less. It eliminated operettas' function as social critique, and its compositionally banal escapism rendered it a mere commodity in the wheels of capitalism. But while Zigoino Liebe was an intentionally a fantasy, this does not mean it did not engage with social concerns. Its analysis demands a broader definition of operetta's purpose, one that focuses not on qualities that operetta lacked, but rather on ones that it possessed for what it gave its audiences. By 1910, Vienna itself was less culturally united than it had been in the heyday of Offenbach and Nestroy. The city was four times as large as it had been in 1857, as well as far more diverse, with many of the new arrivals coming from the Slavic portions of the empire. Operetta's new audience was a middle and lower class population that had recently been integrated into wage labor. The genre's newfound emphasis on beauty, romance, and luxury provided dreams for those people who had little of these things in their daily lives. Satire had limited appeal, and Wagner was largely unknown territory. The migration of the Wagnerian aesthetic into commercial music theater gave audiences a complete sensory escape from their troubles, and for now, let's say, cautiously coincided with a major boom in operetta, one that birthed an internationally disseminated mass popular culture a decade before film became ubiquitous. The modest scholarly literature on operetta still largely judges the genre's shift from Wagnerian parody to aspiration as a degeneration, where popular success is celebrated, but one must never, quote, kowtow to public taste, end quote, as Richard Traubner asserts without being parodic in the principal English language history of the genre. I would suggest that our task as scholars is not to define musical pleasure and certainly not to police it. To do so is to risk becoming a parody. Thank you. Questions for Michaela? Hold on, Tom. I think the microphone's getting to you. Thanks very much. Yes, this Lustig um, Nibelungen is a real treasure. <laughs> um, that is a commercial recording, right? That, that yes. Playing? Yes, there are recording credits on the last page of the handout. Oh, yeah. Um, right. I believe yeah, it's, it's a, still in print. It's a CPO, yeah. Um, so I was wondering, you mentioned just uh, glancingly and talking about that Graz review uh, protesting, you know, the, um, the Oscar Strauss, the Lustig Nibelungen. Um, the, you mentioned that there's anti-Semitic undertones, probably. But I was wondering, um, you know, given the presence, uh, you know, the, the Jewish involvement in operetta around the turn of the century, especially in Vienna, like Leo Fall, um, is the, the Almost libret- all of them were Jewish. Yeah. Lee Harvey was really the only big exception. Right, and the, even the librettist, is it Victor Stein, the librettist for Mary Widow? Uh, yeah, both yeah. of them, uh, Victor Leon and Leo Stein, they were both Jewish. Oh, Victor Leon, yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, so anyway, I was just, I was wondering if anti-Semitism wasn't actually a more prominent part of the public discourse about op- operetta, because um, especially in Vienna, um, especially because the, the whole rhetoric of that review that you're reading sounds so, much, anticipates so closely, um, you know, the Nazi era uh, attacks on the Jewish corrosive influence on uh, you know, German culture. Well, um, I would say for one thing that that is Graz rather than Vienna, and I think there's something of a difference there. Um, and that this was a very explicit political call from a nationalist organization that was incredibly yeah. anti-Semitic. So I, I wouldn't say there's anything ambigu- ambiguous about that particular yeah. case. But you don't find that in Vienna as well? I think it's, it's an element, but honestly, I don't think it's a tremendously large element until you get into the 30s and yeah. the later yeah. 20s. Yeah. Um, it pops up occasionally, um, but honestly, this was an incredibly widely popular form. It appealed to a really large mass audience that was far beyond just Jews. The, the place where you see anti-Semitism is sometimes on the sort of personal attacks, and oddly sometimes actually in the personal celebrations of Jewish figures. Um, I guess the most prominent example of this is this piece Felix Salton wrote about Louis Treumann uh, right after Die Lustige Witwe, uh, called Die Neue Operette, where he celebrates Treumann as being this figure who is very slim and sort of feminine, and it's always these really uncomfortable kind of anti-Semitic stereotypes, actually. Um, so I think it's kind of in there, but I'm still trying to sort of tease it out, and I'm honestly not entirely convinced that it is an enormous part of this. 
maybe we can just go across. Let's start with Ben and then go across. Well, thanks for, for introducing us to a really fascinating topic um, that has all sorts of interesting ideas floating around it. Um, just a quick comment. It's a fascinating counterpoint, perhaps, with the protest in Graz in, what, 1908. And if I'm, if I'm not mixing things up, just a few years previously, Graz was the locale of the premiere of Zalame. Yes, yes, it was. As you and, can read, and the rest is noise. And there must be some really interesting <laughs> points of contact between that, which is another artwork which is designed to outrage, and it raises its own issues of anti-Semitism in a, in a, from a somewhat different perspective, maybe. So that, that might be a really interesting counterpoint to explore. Um, also, I was really interested, I was waiting, I was going to ask you about Karl Kraus, because um, that's a really fascinating point of contact as well. Um, just, I guess, as a point of clear, I have um, two, two questions about that. Did he write anything about Die Lustige Nibelungen? Um, I do not believe so. He wrote about Ein Walsertraum, which is a later work by Strauss. He wrote about several later works by uh, Oscar Strauss, but I do not believe he... I, I, I believe he may have mentioned it in passing, actually positively, because it's the satiric, sort of more Offenbachian kind of piece that he was in favor of. But he never wrote anything major on it. Um, and just from my own clarification, you referred to the uh, term Silver Age operetta. That refers to Lehar and to that new style that's... Yeah, it starts in 1905, well, 1906 with Die Lustige Witwe, which premieres on December 30th, 1905. And then the last comment, I guess, or maybe suggestion or fun, is um, in Hugo Bettauer's book, Die Stadt ohne Juden, mm -hmm. which, which you may know. Yes. One of the things that vanishes when the Jews decamp from Vienna is, I think, operetta and music theater. So that's sort of, I guess, from the other side of it, identifying this um, as, as a Jewish art form, but in a somewhat more validating way, I guess. Well, there, there is kind of a theory that Jews were very invested in operetta, partly because it reinforced this idea of the Austro-Hungarian empires, this kind of like utopia space where they could find a livable home. Um, and the opera, it's, there was this sort of codependent relationship where operetta really celebrated these kinds of uh, Habsburg symbols um, that they themselves were kind of uniquely invested in as these kind of over, not specifically Germanic, not specifically Hungarian, non-national symbols that they could really say were theirs while they could still also be Jewish. Um, I'm drawing here pretty obviously on Marsha Rosenblitz's work. Simon? Yeah. Yes, are there any moments in Lehar's operettas where he actually directly parodies Wagner? I, I have in mind that uh, weird moment in the middle of the gold and silver waltz where he sort of, he moves from a beautiful Viennese waltz into a, a clear parody of Das Rheingold and then sort of moves out again into the, into the waltz. Are there any moments actually in the operas that are similar to that, operettas yes, that are similar there, to that? Yes, there are, well, I think that Zagoyner Liebe is a pretty direct reference, personally. I see it as... 100% Valkyra. But th there's another one that I, in my, the longer version of this paper that I covered, which is, um, if I can go back, um, the piece referenced in this, which is End the Line, which uh, is about two, the second act is entirely two characters lost on top of a mountain um, in act two, and it's like a, one, basically one duet for the entire act, which was pretty much unprecedented for operetta, which is this sort of social cosmopolitan form, and you have these two characters isolated, and there, it's kind of a collage of various Tristan and Isolde references. There's a bit with an English horn, um, which is obviously out of act three rather than act two. Um, it doesn't really come together as a coherent parody, which I think is kind of similar to what you see in Die Lustige Nimelung, and uh, that it's kind of these references without, a, that don't ever coalesce into something that's a really coherent parody, but just things that were kind of in the air. Uh, Helen. Wait, wait for the microphone. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about uh, how Max Steiner's operetta work in, um, before he came to America fit into this, uh, this, this, uh, this question of whether it's more influenced by Wagner or opera or not. And, and the reason I ask is because there, there, there's been a kind of conflicting views um, within film studies about whether, op whether Wagnerian opera or operetta 
um, posed more of a, um, a model for film scoring. And in the anthology Wagner in Cinema, there are some nice articles about that, specifically with regards to Steiner. But this is really interesting, talking about how Wagner had an increasing impact on operetta itself. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about where Steiner fits into that. Well, I'm not sure if I have any specific thoughts about uh, things about him specifically, but is it okay if I talk about Korngold instead? You, sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I think that's really where you can see in a kind of overlap. Um, in that he actually, the, the weird thing about Korngold is that he did write a few operettas which are kind of in the Leihar mold, um, which are completely forgotten today. I don't think there are recordings of any of them. Uh, but he also did these kinds of rewrites um, of 19th century operettas, which I think is interesting that he went back to Johann Strauss, um, did Ein Nachschen Venedig, um, Fledermaus, I believe. Um, and I think that he beefed up the orchestration for one thing. Um, but he was working at the Theater in Wien during a period of economic difficulty, which I think is a major element in terms of film scoring, in that these composers were writing things that sounded bigger and bigger, but their budgets were getting smaller and smaller. Um, and this posed obvious difficulties. Um, in that there really is a direct connection, I believe, between operetta and film scores, particularly in the composers leaving Vienna as the industry collapses from film and as the, well, the war approaches, and they, a lot of them go to Hollywood, and they try to make it there as composers. Um, some of them succeed, most of them don't. Um, I actually have looked into the career of Alfred Grunewald, who went to New York rather than to Los Angeles, and it's quite sad. He's trying to do his sort of operetta thing in New York, and just everyone's like, no, we don't want anything Germanic. And he's trying to do something different, and it's just like not really working out. <laughs> Any last questions? And oh. I guess I should say with this last picture, you can see the dragons there, which are dachshunds wearing dragon suits. Um, I just wanted to point that out because it's, it's there. And I also wanted to footnote, if you're in Vienna and you might be able to see this piece, um, because it is currently in the repertory of the Volksoper. It's, it's a fun production, but I would caution you that all that Bavarian stuff is completely not original. It's kind of funny, but it's, it's all written for that particular modern production. If no more questions, um, I'd like to thank Michaela. What will certainly be preparation for our parody tonight, Das Barbecue, this gets us in the mood for that. You're, you're up for something very ridiculous tonight. <laughs> um, but I would also like to thank our panelists um, for really just giving us eye-opening and interesting material right till the very end. And it's been a very enjoyable panel. And I'd like to thank them all together.